Hi students, we are in the middle of the solutions chapter and we've talked a lot about how we make a solution and how we have a solute and a solvent and now I just want to go back and remind you about uh, the different forms of matter. So in the um, first chapter, when we first started this class, we talked about how we have this really broad category called matter. And we can split matter up in two ways. We can go pure substances, and then on the right we have mixtures. And mixtures is what we're going to talk about in this section. So just to remind you over on the pure substances side, those are things that are not mixtures. And substances can either just be an element or it can be a compound. And if we take a look at the picture at the bottom, uh, we have helium gas. And helium gas, all it is, is a bunch of helium atoms floating around. So all you have is one type of atom there. And with the pure compounds, what we have is we have compounds which are made of different atoms, but all you have is that one compound. So the example that we have here is water. So all you have here is a bunch of water molecules. So that's a pure compound. Even though you have different types of atoms there, they're in specific ratios and you just have one thing. Now, if we go on over to the right to mixtures, what we have is heterogeneous mixtures and homogeneous mixtures or homogeneous mixtures. Now with heterogeneous mixtures, what we have is we have two things that are mixed and the different parts of the mixture, say right here and right here, they're gonna have different chemical and physical characteristics. So if you took a sample from above and a sample from below and you tested them, you definitely see that they had different melting points, boiling points, electrical conductivity, density, blah, 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 blah. What we also see with a heterogeneous mixture is we see an interface. So with your eyeballs, you can see the boundary between one substance and the other substance. You can see where one substance ends and the other substance begins. Now, uh, over here we have homogeneous mixtures. So we have a mixture of different things but you can't see the boundary between one substance and another substance. And if we took a sample from over here and a sample from over here, we'd find that they had the same chemical and physical characteristics. So in this example, we have a cup of tea. Now in the tea, you have water, and you have caffeine molecules, and you have sugar molecules if you've dissolved some sugar in your tea. And you've got tannins that give the tea that color. And all of those molecules are floating around together. They're all mixed in. But our eyeballs cannot see where the caffeine molecule ends and the water molecule begins. So there's the difference there. So... And just to go ahead and define this a little bit more, with the heterogeneous mixture, what we have is we have solute particles that are above 200 nanometers. Now, some books or other reference materials will say 1,000 nanometers. So, what we're trying to say there is that the particles are larger in size than with homogeneous mixtures. 
So with homogeneous mixtures, we have particle sizes that are less than one nanometer. So the particle sizes are really small, like a caffeine molecule or a sugar molecule. And remember, homogeneous mixtures are called solutions most often in chemistry or in this level of chemistry when we're talking about them. All right, so what we might have noticed there is that homogeneous mixtures have particle sizes that are less than one nanometer and heterogeneous mixtures have particle sizes that are greater than 200 nanometers or some sources would say 1000 nanometers. Um, so you might notice that there is a lot of in between there. So if you have a particle size that's greater than one nanometer, but it's less than 200 nanometers, then what do we do with that? It's not classified as heterogeneous or homogeneous. Um, and that brings us to something called colloids. Um, so colloids tend to have particle sizes that are somewhere in between. And these are classified as homogeneous mixtures, but they're a little bit different because of the size of those particles. And uh, because the particle size is in between traditional homogeneous mixture particle sizes and traditional heterogeneous uh, particle sizes, what we get is we get uh, properties that are in between heterogeneous and homogeneous mixtures. And some examples of colloids are jello, fog, dust and air, mayonnaise, and over here we have milk. Now, milk, a lot of times we think of it as homogeneous or a traditional homogeneous mixture uh, because it says homogenized a lot of times on the milk carton. But what we have here is we have an aqueous, oops, can't write off the page, I guess, aqueous solution. And what is dispersed in the aqueous solution is fat globules. Now, if you have non-fat milk, you have fewer fat globules. And if you have whole milk, you have a whole lot of fat globules in there. That's why whole milk tastes really thick. But what we don't see is we don't see the butter fat settling out because the butter fat that settles out, they take it off. So it usually rises to the top. They take it off and they make butter and cream out of that. And then they spin this at a really high speed and they heat it up also to pasteurize it. And that makes the fat globules into these tiny little microscopic things and it homogenizes it. So if you had the cream at the top, that layer of fat like that, that would definitely be a heterogeneous mixture because you could see the boundary between the fat and the milk or the aqueous layer there. Now, how do we know when something is a colloid? Well, along came this Irish scientist named John Tyndall, and what he did is he described light scattering that colloids cause. And what he said is if you shine a, a beam of light through a colloid, you can see the outlines of the beam. And you will see this if you're in a park, um, laying on your blanket, or having a picnic in the afternoon and you've got little dust particles that are in the air and the light shines through it, you'll see those little rays. Where you'll also see the Tyndall effect is if you've ever been to Vegas during the winter and you're driving home on Sunday night and you've got to make it home because you have chemistry class Monday morning and if you had it at 8 o'clock, it wouldn't be with me because I don't teach 8 o'clock classes because I'm a night owl. 
but maybe you have somebody else at eight o'clock in the morning and you got to get there for that class and you're coming down over the Cajon Pass. So that's when you start heading down that mountain from Victorville into San Bernardino. And all of a sudden, you'll hit fog and you can't see. And you're like, ah, oh my goodness. And you have to get behind a semi truck and follow the semi all the way home. And what you might notice is that you can see the beam of light from your headlights because what we have is we have air and we have water droplets suspended in that air. So that's why we say back here that fog is a colloid. So to take a look at the classification of different types of colloids, what we have is this little chart right here. And you can see that we can have different physical states um, in different physical states. So we've got solid, liquid, and gas, and any of those can be dissolved in any of the others. And in with colloids, we don't tend to refer to the different components as solute and solvent. We call them dispersed phase and dispersed medium. So the dispersed phase, usually that is what we call the solute when we're talking about homogeneous mixtures. And the dispersing medium, we can think of that as the solvent. So the dispersed phase, it's what's being dispersed. So um, with the fog, where is fog? There we go, fog right here. What we would have is liquid, which would be water, dispersed in gas. So the water would be the dispersed phase and the gas would be the dispersing medium. The air is the gas. So the very first Example, notice that you have a solid dispersed in a gas and it tells you that there's no name for this. Now, sometimes you'll see it called an aerosol. That doesn't tend to be what we think of when we think of aerosol. Usually we think of something that we're spraying out of a can as an aerosol, like hairspray or something like that, which is a liquid dissolved in a gas. But Sometimes some references will say that a solid dissolved in <clears throat> a gas is also an aerosol. And a solid um, in a liquid, what we have here is a sol. And then if we've got a solid in a solid, uh, what this is sometimes called is a solid sol. And then a liquid in a gas, an aerosol, and then a liquid in a liquid, we've got an emulsion. So if we think of milk, mayonnaise, butter, or if we've got um, salad dressing is often where we'll see an emulsion. And what we'll have um, as an emulsifying agent, if you look at the back of a, solid, a salad dressing bottle, it'll often say lecithin or soy lecithin or eggs because eggs contain a lot of lecithin. And that lecithin molecule is going to help um, keep the nonpolar uh, part of this mixture suspended in the polar portion. So the um, fat or the oil suspended in the water layer. That way, when you have your Italian dressing and you shake it up, you don't uh, get an oil slick on your salad. You get more of the mixture. A liquid in a solid, that is a gel. So jellies or jello and then a gas and a liquid, this is a foam. And we like foams, like whipped cream and um, shaving cream and whatnot. Now a gas in a solid, what we'll see is that we have a lot of gas 
uh, bubbles in solid when we have soaps that float so it makes them uh, um, low density and sometimes these are called solid foams. All right, so what happens if you have particles that are even larger? Well, when you get larger particles, what tends to happen is those particles will settle out. So you can mix them together for a little bit, but give it some time and you'll have some settling there. So these are classified as heterogeneous mixtures, but they're really in between um, traditional homogeneous and traditional heterogeneous mixtures. So you can get those particles um, to stay suspended for a while, but then eventually they'll settle out. And examples of this we have are muddy water and liquid medications. like amoxicillin. So that's that pink stuff that all of us get when we're kids and it, um, it tastes really yummy and you usually get it when you have an ear infection and you have to shake it up and then take it um, because if you let it sit for too long, uh, the solid part of the suspension will settle out to the bottom and that's no good okay so suspensions most things where that they say go ahead and give it a shake before you use it those are suspensions so if we're taking a look at the relative particle size we can see right here that our solutions we have a really really small particle size so less than one nanometer and so this right here is a solution. So we have the solute evenly distributed in the solvent there and we don't have any settling out. And the next example is a colloid. And a colloid has larger particle sizes. So here we have one nanometer to one micrometer and that is one of the references that will tell you that it's a thousand nanometers, okay? So these have larger particles, but the particles don't settle out. Now the suspensions, we've got very large particles. Again, they'll say, I can't talk tonight. They'll stay suspended for a while, but they'll settle out, okay? So we've got muddy water there. Now what happens if we use the Tyndall test on these three different types of mixtures? Well, with the solution right here, you can't see the beam. So there's no outline for the beam of light. And for the colloid, you can see the beam and the particles do not settle out. With a suspension, you can also see the beam, but what's the difference between the colloid? The particles will eventually settle to the bottom here and that's how we know the difference. All right, we're going to change gears a little bit and we're going to talk about classification of water soluble substances. So solutes, and we should say that, solutes are separate into their ions. Uh, when they're dissolved, so they have to be soluble, obviously, and conduct electricity, these are called electrolytes, okay? So that makes sense when we talk about collect, uh, conducting electricity, electrolytes. And there's two types of these. There's strong electrolytes and there's weak electrolytes. 
Now, the strong electrolytes, um, these are going to be solvents that completely come apart or dissociate into their ions. So they're going to come apart into cations and anions when you dissolve them in water. So some examples are sodium chloride, magnesium bromide, and HCl. So sodium chloride, when it dis dissolves in water, it dissociates, it comes apart into sodium and chloride. And magnesium bromide, when it dissolves in water, it dissociates into Mg plus two, and you have two bromides. And the bromides are separate. They float away and they're separate. So we don't put Br2 we draw the bromides separately. So they're floating around in the water there separately. And these are strong electrical conductors because if they dissolve and they disso dissociate completely, you've got a lot of um, positive and negative charges floating around. And the positive charges, so the cations, those like to go to the electrode called the cathode. And the anions, they like to go to the electrode called the anode. And that's gonna complete the electrical circuit and you'll see that the light bulb will light up. Now, how do we write the equation uh, for the dissociation of these substances in water. Well, for a strong electrolyte, what you'll see is that the strong electrolyte will be written as its regular formula on the left-hand side, and you'll either see A, Q, or S over there, but most of the time you're going to see the solid symbol. And then you'll see that it'll come apart into its ions. So we have Na plus and Cl minus there. And then the AQ will tell you that those things are dissolved in water. Okay, so the aqueous means water. And it means that those are floating around on their own. So see how the sodium ions are not connected to the chloride ions right there? And another thing I need to point out is that a lot of times you will see the equation written like this with water over the arrow there. And that just lets you know that you're dissolving sodium chloride in water. And the single headed arrow, so we have one direction, it's telling you that pretty much all of the sodium chloride is going to the ionic state and that there's not a whole lot of the sodium chloride left um, as a solid, if anything, if there's... All right, so weak electrolytes. These are solutes that when we dissolve them in water, they're only partially going to come apart or partially dissociate into their ions. And some examples are HF, uh, NH3, which is ammonia, and acetic acid. And these guys are weak electrical conductors because you need a lot of uh, positive and negative charges floating around in the water here in order to complete that circuit right there. So over here, you'll have your battery. And we can see that the light bulb doesn't light up very much. So again, the positive ions are going towards the cathode. So the the cations, which start with C, are going to the electrode that starts with C, the cathode. And the anions, that word starts with A, they're going to the electrode that also starts with A, the anode. So how do we write the equation for the dissociation of a weak electrolyte? in um, water. So we're going to write the weak electrolyte on the left hand side and we're going to have an AQ symbol here. So we're saying that we're going to dissolve this stuff in water and we're still going to have some of this stuff hanging around. And you see this right here? 
I couldn't get it to display this, which you really should. So we've got an arrow going one way and an arrow going another way, which is indicating that the reaction goes in both directions. So this should also be this right here. So the HF is going to come apart a little bit to form a little bit of H plus and a little bit of F minus and you will see AQ here and AQ here as well as AQ here. So the double headed arrows again they're telling you that the reaction's going both ways and most importantly they're telling you that you still have a lot of that hanging around. A lot of your HF is not coming apart. It's a floating around hole in the solution. And then we have non-electrolytes. And non-electrolytes are substances that will dissolve in water, but they don't separate into ions when they dissolve. And some examples are sucrose, so we've got a regular table sugar, and we have ethanol, which is our drinking alcohol or our biofuel there. So uh, water will dissolve those substances, but it won't split them up into different parts. Now, because it the water doesn't split these substances up into uh, cations and anions. You don't have charges floating around that are com going to complete the circuit right here. So your light bulb is not going to light up. So you're not conducting um, electrical current here. So how we write the equation for the dissolution of or the dissolving of a non-electrolyte in water is this. So you write the substance's chemical formula. So right here we can see we've got sucrose. That's regular sugar that we bake with. And you'll see the state that it's in right there. And so it's solid or liquid and sucrose is definitely solid. That's that white sugar that we use. And the single headed arrow is indicating to you that this stuff is really soluble. So most of it is gonna go ahead and be dissolved by water. So we have a one directional reaction right there. And on this other side, we'll write AQ. So you're writing exactly the same chemical formula on each side. It's just that on this side, it was in a solid form. And then over here, you're saying, now I've dissolved it in water. So it's floating around in water. And because you have exactly the same thing on each side, it's also telling you the water didn't pull it apart. It is exactly the same. So let's go ahead and do some problems so we can practice this. So number one says the following salts are strong electrolytes. Write a balanced equation for the dissociation in water. Now let's look at A. It says lithium bromide. Lithium is in group one. It's an alkali metal. It's above sodium and potassium. So we've got a metal And we've got a non-metal here. And we've also got the anion bromide. And remember when we talked about solubility, we said that all of our sodium, sorry, excuse me, all of our chlorides, bromides, and iodides are going to be soluble in water. So this one is definitely soluble and it's ionic, so it's going to come apart into its ions. And the question already told you that it's a strong electrolyte. So it has to be something that's soluble and is coming apart into its ions. So the question is telling you all you need to know. And this is an ionic substance, so most likely it's a solid, which it is. And then we write the reaction arrow, and you can put the water above the reaction arrow, or you can leave that off, and it's going to separate into the lithium cation, and that's gonna be floating around in water, so we put aqueous, and the bromide anion, and that's also floating around in water, so we go ahead and we put AQ. So what that looks like is you've got your beaker here, and you've got a whole lot of waters floating around, and within that, you've got your lithium and 
you've got your bromide and they're separate. Okay, so we have iron three chloride there. And we've got a metal and a non-metal again. And what we would do with this is we'd say FeBr3, and that's a solid. And we'll go ahead and put water above the arrow right there. And here we're pairing iron with bromide. So again, bromide is going to cause solubility. So chlorides, bromides, and iodides, those things are going to be soluble for the most part. So water is going to pull this compound apart into its cations and its anions. And its cation is going to be the metal, so we have iron, and it has a plus charge, but it's not plus one like lithium, it's plus three. And how we knew that is because we paired it with three bromides, and bromides are always what? They're always minus one. So you have to have a positive charge of plus three because you have three minus ones in order to make a neutral compound. So you have plus three and minus three because you have three minus ones. And a neutral compound is a happy compound. So that's how we knew that. Okay, so the iron is floating around in water. So we put in parentheses AQ and then we're going to put three Br minus, because remember, water's gonna pull this thing apart completely, and the bromides don't stay together. They float around on their own, like that, okay? So we have those three bromides floating around on their own in water, and so we put in parentheses AQ. Don't forget your coefficients on these. If you need to put the ones here, oops, that's a one. Just for clarity, go right ahead. Okay, so HCN is a weak acid. Write a balanced equation for its dissociation in water. Okay, so we write HCN and this is a weak acid, which means that it only comes apart a little bit. And acids and bases, uh, in the acids and bases chapter, we'll learn uh, more about strong acids and strong bases. But weak acids, they only are going to release a little bit of H+. And so because it doesn't come apart very much, it can't be a strong electrolyte. It's going to be a weak electrolyte. So we draw the double-headed arrow. Oops, hold on a second. Got ahead of myself there. We draw the double-headed arrow to indicate that the reaction goes both ways. And what I was forgetting there is to write that we have HCN in water. And then a little bit of it comes apart. So we have a little bit of H plus floating around on its own in water and a little bit of what floating around on its own in water. It's a polyatomic ion, cyanide. So again, the double-headed arrow is telling us that we've still got that stuff as well as that stuff and that stuff. So if we were to draw that up here in our beaker, what we would have is of course our water molecules, tons and tons of those. And we would have some HCN that hasn't dissociated or hasn't come apart and you'd have some H plus and you'd have some Cl minus. Now with strong electrolytes backing up to 1A and 1B, you don't have that anymore in your solution. All of that stuff is going to dissociate. It's all going to um, be broken up into its ions. But again, with your weak acid or your weak electrolyte right there, you still have the original substance. 
Now, number three says, do you expect fructose, which is C6H12O6, to be a strong electrolyte, a weak electrolyte, or a non-electrolyte? And write the balanced equation for its dissociation in water. Well, before we even write anything, if we look back here, we can see that we've got another sugar, sucrose. And sucrose is a non-electrolyte. So we might also expect fructose to do the same. And it does. Fructose is readily dissolvable in water. So if we have sucrose crystals, we will say that we've got um, fructose and then in parentheses we put the solid and then it's very soluble. So we have the one weight arrow and then we have the exact same molecule because water does not pull it apart. And the only difference here is what in those parentheses is a Q. So you're saying you take this molecule and you dissolve it in water, but the molecule's still whole, and we're just indicating that it's in water with that AQ. So it looks like this. So if we ignore the electrodes that are there, we can think of lots and lots of water floating around, and then you have whole sugar molecules floating around, and you don't have ions there, so you don't complete the circuit, so you're not conducting electricity there. So that's an electrolyte. So again, same chemical formula on each side of the equation and a single headed arrow and you just switch the physical state from solid or liquid to aqueous on the other side. All right, next time we're going to talk about osmosis and diffusion. Until then, bye-bye.